Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our main speaker for this morning's meeting uh, from Thousand Oaks, Gary C. Temporarily. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Gary. I'm an alcoholic addict. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank you all for asking me, give me a chance to to get up here and work my program. Um, I have uh, two what it was like, two what happened, and one what it's like now. That's, that's not because I slipped. That's because I am a, a, a monument to Irish, Welsh, arrogance, stupidity, pride, and, and self-will run riot in that I quit drinking some 27 years ago for the wrong reasons. I quit because my wife and my son wanted me to, but I didn't need any program. You know, I was a tough guy. I was going to do it on my own. So I went on a white knuckle dry drunk for the next 19 years. And that takes a lot of stupidity to do that, folks. Let me tell you. And it's, uh, I'm here to tell you today that the, the disease is called alcoholism. And the ism part of the disease kicked my butt for 19 years after I had stopped all the alcohol. So this isn't just about stopping drinking. When you stop drinking, then you have to face your real problem, which is you and living with you. Uh, I identify as an alcoholic for two reasons. Number one, my mother was an alcoholic, and as we know, this disease is hereditary. And number two, because as far back as I've been able to go in my mind and uncover and discover and discard, I can't recall a time, no matter how small I was, when the four horsemen of the alcoholic weren't riding my shoulders. And that's terror, bewilderment, anxiety, and despair. Even as a little kid, my, my father was a very famous man and uh, in show business, and uh, he, my mother was, like I said, was an alcoholic. My father looked around before I was born, according to my mother, and he didn't like what he saw in the town that he lived in. He, he didn't like what he saw, what he termed Hollywood kids, and he wasn't going to have any in his house. That meant if you were a Hollywood kid to him, that was if you had parents who gave you money when you did wrong. Uh, if you went to jail, they bailed you out very quickly. If you cracked up a car, they gave you a new one. And, uh, and just kept throwing money at you and sending you away to schools and, and keeping you out of their hair as much as they could. And he said there weren't going to be any of those in his house. Evidently, must have scared him pretty bad. Because instead of doing a 90-degree turn, he did about a 180. See? And he, he in his uh, estimation, you, uh, you made men, uh, out of, you made, uh, uh, men by, by molding boys through discipline and a lot of rules and regulations. And then you made them the kind of men you wanted them to be. And we had rules and regulations for every hour, every waking hour of every day. He didn't believe in letting your mind idle for any amount of time. There was no laying around on the grass and looking at the clouds going by or none of that jazz. It was all work, and when you weren't working, you were studying. When you weren't studying, you were in bed. And uh, these rules were all laid down, and they were all explained, and uh, there was never your side to it. If one of them was broken, you got called in, you were asked if you, if you broke the rule, and you said yes, and then, you, then they asked you why, and you said, I don't know. I don't know was a safe answer, see, because anything else would get you in trouble. He had, a, he had a pretty good mind on him and a pretty good tongue, too, and he, he could lash you pretty good with that. So you just said, I don't know. And then the whipping you got was with a leather belt and it had some silver conchos on it with some little points sticking out. And you took your pants down and bent over and he, he gave it to you till you bled. Very calmly, without a great deal of hysteria or anything like that, he just whipped you till you bled. That was a sign to stop. And it was always with an attitude kind of like, I don't know why these dummies make me do this to them. And uh, after that, when we got older, he used to take a hardwood malacca cane, and he'd bend us over the couch in the hallway, and he'd take it like a baseball bat, and he'd step into us and, and hit us with that 13 to 15 times. Uh, trouble is, when you start doing that with an alcoholic, at least with this alcoholic, I forget the message and just start fighting the messenger. See, I don't give a damn what he's saying to me. I don't care what he's trying to teach me or what, anything else. I'm not going to learn nothing from him. All I'm going to do is beat him. 
at his own game. And beating him at his own game was to be, my, 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 my goal was to be able to turn around while he was doing that and stare him dead in the eye. And when he was finished, just pick up my pants and walk out of the room. And I got so I could do that, see, real easy. And it infuriated him, but I kept doing it. See, I get to my room, go, wow, 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 and my ass and dan <laughs> dance around. But never in front of him, boy. Yeah, and that, I got so I could stuff my feelings. I started to get so I could stuff my feelings real good, real early. Um, my mother used to whip us when my father wasn't there. She had to carry out the rules, too. She wasn't naturally inclined to do that, but when he left to, to go on the road, he left her in charge. And, and when we do wrong or we break a rule in front of my mother, my mother would always say, do you want me to wait till your father comes home or you want me to give it to you now? We'd always say, you give it to us now. You know, get it over. <laughs> wait. She used to take the, the peach tree switch up and down the back of her legs. You know, that was always a goodie. And you, and, and you weren't allowed to jump because she'd get crazy. See, she'd, get, she'd be loaded and she'd be whipping on you with that switch. And if you jumped and got out of the way, she'd get mad. She gets, she gets sore because you moved, you know, so you had, to, you had to just stand still and go, ah, damn, oh, God, and then just, you know, yeah, Ma, I'll be good, 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 and then get out of the way, you know, real quick. And you had to make decisions quick, you know, I'm, I'm also a ACA. You have to, when you're, when you're a child of an alcoholic, you have to make decisions real fast. Like, we had a rule in the house, when we came home from school, we had to come into the house, up to her bedroom, because Mom was always in bed. She was never feeling well. She always had a headache. She always had a bellyache. She always had some kind of ache. She was tired. She was depressed. She was sleeping. She was never drunk. I want you to understand, my mother was never drunk. At the price of your head on your shoulders, my mother was never drunk. See? But the idea was when you came up, the rule was you had to cross the room and kiss her hello. Now, what you had to do is you had to start at the door and you had to say, Hi, Mom, how are you? What's going on? What kind of day are you having? And you asked her questions and you listened to her answers to tell First, if she was drunk. Second of all, if she was, how drunk was she? Because if she was sober, the rule, you had to kiss her hello, so you had to bend over to kiss her hello. If she was sober, you got to kiss. If she was in various stages of drunkenness, you got whacked in the face, see? Now, depending on how drunk she was, how fast she was with her hand. So you had to gauge all that out, and as you leaned down, if you knew she was drunk, you leaned down and turned your head real quick, and you got it here, and you were the winner for the day. The dummy of the day was the fourth kid who walked in and didn't know and got slapped in the face. Then we all laughed at him when we got back to our room, see? These are the kind of games we played at home. So, and, and my father was, was, he didn't believe that he was the only one to discipline us. He, any school we went to, and he sent us to only Catholic schools and Catholic military schools. And when he put us in these schools, he'd say, if they give you any trouble, you take care of them when you're here, and then phone me at home, and I'll get them when they come home. And that was, that was about the way it was for us. Uh, God Almighty, it was just... There were rules for getting up in the morning, rules for going to bed. If we had to get up at 7 o'clock. I'll give you just a small example. We had to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we had a housekeeper that, that, that woke us up, and she was also an informer and a squealer, and she, you know. <laughs> anything we did wrong, she ran immediately and told, and uh, fanatically devoted to my mother and, and, and all that. My mother, she was the one who was always enabling my mother. She was always telling me how my mother was sleeping and all that. Anyway... She'd be up first, and she'd stand outside in the hallway, and if anybody heard, if she heard any of us whispering before time to get up in the morning, she'd come in, and she was allowed to whip us with a wire coat hanger. That's where you get the wire coat hanger stick going. That's why I believed that girl when she wrote that book, you know. Because I've been the recipient of the wire coat hanger many a time. Um, if we left something on the floor of our room, the next day we had to wear it to school around our neck. So we used to go to school with underwear, on a sock, whatever, you know, anything hanging off of and the ridicule was pretty hard to take, you know. We get to school, as far as, as, far as dealing with our... At school, my father, with my father, A's were accepted. That's how it should be. B's were okay. C's were frowned on. D's got you a whipping, and F's got you a whipping, and every day you came home from school and you sat down at a desk and they put a book in front of your face and they said, memorize. Didn't make any difference if it had anything to do with what you were learning in school at that time or not, but you memorized till dinner time and you came down and you recited, and if you didn't recite right, you didn't get dinner. And that went on till the next report card came. So we were like a little tight fist, just me and my brothers. We didn't know what it created for us. We, we didn't know what the hell we were. We didn't know who we were. We didn't know what we were supposed to do. We were so goddamn busy trying to keep those rules all the time. We never thought ever. And we also learned this. Don't reach out to do nothing creative. Don't start to think ahead and think you know how to do something and do something. Go do it. Because in doing that, you might break a rule. And then it was ass busting time again. See? So instead of reaching out, me and my brothers started to play defense with life. We started to just break, we just, we just kept doing this. We just kept back from reaching out to do anything good. And then life to me was like having ten toes and, and or I mean, 
Yeah, ten toes and ten fingers. And plugging them all in, and there's always one extra hole with the, with the water coming through. You never, there was always a rule you broke. There was always something that went wrong. It never went perfect. See? And the only way to succeed in, under this regime was to be perfect. Perfect was, it was a hundred or nothing. There was no in between. There was no good job. You did 75% right. It was a hundred or nothing. And God, the tension was just incredible. God, I remember shot, mo I spent most of my life just scared to death, just shaking inside, just constantly. The, the, the terror was there that I was going to do something wrong. The bewilderment was what the hell, what, which one was I going to break? The anxiety was when am I going to do it? And the despair was, oh shit, now I've done it. And it was usually I did it early in the day. See? And I knew Dad wasn't coming home until 6 o'clock at night. And I knew he was going to know. And as soon as 6 o'clock at night, sure as the sun set, I was going to get whipped. There was no my side of the story. So I had to wait all day for that to happen. And the waiting, oh boy, that was, that, was, that was the toughest part of it. Uh, in school, we go to school. Uh, we, we had, like I said, we had, we had this, this, this thing called a famous name attached to us. And, and I, I don't remember just what the hell, I, I wasn't too sure what the hell it meant. You know, I'd go to school, I knew this much. I'd go to school and they'd call roll and I'd raise my hand and at recess there were three guys waiting to kick the hell out of me. And I never could figure out why. I just thought it was something I did, you know. Uh, I had a bad temper. So real early on, see, I got, I got so I didn't like that too much. So real early on, I got to fighting back. I was too slow to run. And, uh, and I, was, I was too frightened to do anything else, so I just fought back like a maniac. And I started to learn things, see. I learned about violence real early. I learned that you didn't have to win these fights, see. I learned you could lose. What happened with me was a red veil would drop. When I started getting hit, and everything moved in slow motion, I could see it coming, and, and think punches and kicks and stuff bounced off me, and I didn't feel them. I didn't feel them until the next day. The next day I was sore, but then I didn't. And that was, a, that was a benefit to me. And the next thing I learned was real important, and that was when somebody's doing that to you, if you can just tear a hunk out of them some way, make them bleed somehow, or make them worry about, about the next three, two or three hours whether they're going to see you again, or worry about the next day if you're going to get them, or something like that, you get a reputation like that, and they leave you alone. You don't have to beat them, but they don't want a chunk torn out of them, see? And they don't want to get messed up at all. They want to whip on somebody that ain't going to do nothing. So I found out, hell, I can fight, and they're going to leave me alone, and they're going to think I'm crazy, and I won't have any friends, but that's okay, too. I didn't want any friends. I was the point where I didn't want anybody, you know? I just want everybody to leave me the hell alone, because I was too busy trying to keep rules and regulations to keep from getting my ass whipped all the time. Also, I had an extra thing that I got it for that my three brothers didn't get it for, and that's, if you'll notice, if you haven't already, is I leave the room... Today, if you look at my south end, I have a rather wide posterior. And uh, that aggravated the hell out of my father for some reason. He had one himself, and uh, he was afraid that I was going to be what he called a fat kid. So he picked a weight out of midair, and he said, you're going to weigh this every Tuesday night or else I'm going to whip you. So every Tuesday night I had to climb on the scale, and if I was this much over, I got a whipping. If I was this much under, he'd look at me and say, safe again. And then tremendous relief would take over. And for three days, I'd sneak all the food in the house I could find. You know, I'd be raiding the larder at all. I get, you know those five-pound box of uh, seized candy? I got so I could steal five or ten pieces out of that thing, you'd never know they were gone. I'd spread the papers out under the ones that were still there, you know, <laughs> move them all around. Beautiful. And I didn't even trust my brothers, man. I'd take that stuff and put it up under my bedpost at night, saying I'd wait till the brother I slept with went to sleep, and then I'd, go, then I'd throw the candy down. Well, about Friday, I'd be seven pounds overweight. Then I'd have to run around and find all the milk and magnesia I could find at school and home and everything else. And I'd just, I'd take that stuff and I'd run the track and I'd starve till Tuesday and I'd get on that scale again and be like this, tremendous really. But they were setting up the binge purge thing. Now I was a junkie before I was ever a drunk. Because around 10 years old, my old man discovered the diet doctors. And nobody, in his defense, I gotta say for him, in, in this particular case, nobody knew what the hell they were. Everybody thought they were good, you know, and it was perfect for dad. Dad paid money, I went to the doctor, I got pills from the doctor, I came home, I took the pills, and I, I was losing weight. Of course, the fact that I was talking about eight times faster than I used to, and my jaw, <laughs> and my jaw was always wired like this, and I was always smiling a lot and walking around like this, he thought I was real happy because I was losing weight, you know. What the hell did I know? I know I just felt wonderful. Everything was just great, you know. And uh, so I was, I was on that before I... Then I found a thing in school that really was like my out. See, my out. This was my kick out. I found out about sports. Now, I went to Catholic military schools, and the Catholic military schools, they got 11-man football with pads, and they got 9-man baseball teams with, with, with uniforms, and they, they, they got coaches, and they teach you how to play the game right, and you really learn, and so you're actively in sports at, in, in grammar school. And that was good for me. See, I was already a paranoid schizophrenic, 
And I, I was a great linebacker and a catcher. Perfect positions for an alcoholic, you know. The whole world's coming down on me from every direction. I don't know where they're coming from and they're going to kill me. Get ready. I, you know. So I, I was perfect for that. But the big thing about sports was, number one, I didn't have to go home until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And number two, with the anxiety level that was building in my body every day and the fear and the tension, by the, three, at the time 3 o'clock came around, it was real good and beneficial for me to be able to go put on a uniform of some kind, go out and just kick the hell out of people and have them kick the hell out of me for about two and a half hours. See? Then I'd go and take a shower, I'd come out, I'd ride home. I'd be euphoric up here. My head would be just fine, it would be peaceful and calm and content, and I would think clearly my body was tired which is a good state to be in. And I would get home, and an A day for me when I got home was that my old man was on the road, my mother was already passed out, and that ogre that we had in the house supposed to take care of us was taking care of her. I could sneak downstairs, have dinner, come back up, do my homework, and listen to the radio, and go to bed. And that was an A day. That, that was a big day for me, see? But I wanted out, man. I wanted out from underneath so bad, so bad. And we, we had another reputation that was going, too. And that was because my, my father was famous as a, as a big family man. So we always had to, we were always in front of the press as a family all the time. And the image that was created was that we were four little cats and jammer kids who just bedeviled him all the time. And, and he was just a wonderful guy and just took it. See, well, that was a load of shit. But, <laughs> you know, we had to say things to him and scripts and stuff and shows that we did that we never would ever dare utter in our wildest dreams in real life, you know. And as we were rehearsing them, we'd be saying the words, and it would be hard not to look at him instead of looking at the script, you know. And, and as long as he was smiling, it was okay. But boy, when we put those scripts down, we had to change again into something else different, you know. And he'd have the press to the house, and before they, when they'd come to ask us questions, he'd say to them, what goes on inside this house doesn't go outside this house, you understand? Or he'd say to us. And we'd say, okay. So we'd sit there like four little monkeys with those diamond sweaters on like this, you know, and and uh, the press would go, isn't it wonderful? And we'd go, oh, yes, it's great, it's wonderful. And they said, no, it is, but it's terrible. Be, you know, we go, oh, no. It's, we got so we just read their tones of voice. We didn't know what the hell they said. We could just kind of read their mood, and we'd just go with whatever it was and, and get out of the way. And then Dad would put us to work after they left. He'd say, back in the trunk. That was his favorite expression, which meant take the good clothes off and put the bad clothes on and go back to the work. And... Like I say, this sports was an out for me. And I figured out I was going to be a professional athlete. That was my little dream. That was my little alcoholic dream that I put in my head and didn't tell anybody. See, I was going to, I was going to work toward that. That was going to be my out. And I knew I had to go to a high school where they had a real good football and baseball team. And I had to make a rep for myself because I wasn't going to get any scholarship because everybody knew he had plenty of bread. So I, I, I did what I thought. I, I thought I really fooled him. I found a high school in Northern California. It was a Jesuit boarding school. See, in San Jose, California. Now, I, he was educated by the Jesuits. And for those of you who don't know, the Jesuit priests, when they educate you, they really educate you, and they're disciplinarians. And that was my father's favorite word. So when I picked this school out, he said, oh, yeah, he said, that's wonderful. You go there. That'd be great for you. He thought, he, you know, and inside I'm chuckling because I know I got him fooled. See, I'm going up there for a whole different reason. So I went on up there, and I can never forget the first, the first time we had a meeting as freshmen, and the, and the prefect of discipline stood in front of us, and he was going to tell us when we were allowed off campus. He said, you're allowed out Friday nights till 10.30, Saturday nights till 11 o'clock, and Sunday afternoons from 1 to 5. And all the freshmen jumped up and down and started screaming, Nazi war camp! Oh, geez, it's like San Quentin! This is jail! Oh, it's terrible! And I, heard, I looked, did one of these, and I started yelling too the same way. But inside, I was jumping for joy. That's more freedom than I ever had in my whole life up until then. The first Friday night out, I went down to the bus stop, down two blocks down, I sat down and watched the cars go by till 10.30 and came back. That's all I did, but I wasn't going to miss that freedom. I had no plans, but I wasn't going to be sitting on that campus. I come back at 10.29 and 30 seconds, you know. High school went like I hoped it would. The discipline, area, the, the discipline was there like it was in my life before I got there. The, the Jesuits, you, when you go to a Jesuit high school, you will pass everything that they give you. Now, if, if you start to fail in a course, they will bring you in and they want to know why. If you, if you don't tell them why, they'll put a tutor on you. If your grades don't improve, they'll take you and the tutor and they give you two extra hours of study all the night. But boy, you're going to pass everything they give you. And you're going to pass it legitimately, see. So the pressure was on, the grades did well. And, and football and baseball went great. And it went along just like I hoped it would. I was, I was getting some a good reputation built up until my junior year and everything was going real good. And then, uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, the CIF called up there. They had made a mistake in reading my... When I handed them my records to go up there, I explained a, a discrepancy there. They said that was fine, it was good, I would have four years of eligibility. They waited until my senior year, they called up there and they canceled my senior year of eligibility. And I had the paperwork to prove they were wrong. And I went around to every authority figure that there was with those, and they read the papers and they said, you're right, they're wrong, but that's too bad, there's nothing we can do about it. 
That's how it was then. It isn't like it is today where a high school kid, a high school athlete, if he gets a job, he goes gets a lawyer, he goes down and they fight it and they, they get the school board and they, he gets reinstated. They just said, you can't do it. You're out. And right then is when my whole life caved in. I was 17 years old. I built this whole dream all by myself in my head and I hadn't shared it with anybody and boy, they knocked that out and knocked that out of the saddle. And when they did that, I said to myself, you're a loser. You ain't never going to be nothing in your whole life, and your life's over, man, so forget it. Now, I couldn't start drinking right away because I was still in that high school. I had another year to go. We did a little drinking on the weekends. You know, you get a case of quartz, and then you go to the drive-in, and you sit there, and you drink the beer, and the guys from the other school pull up in the car next to you, and you start shooting off your mouths, and then you have a big fight, and when the siren rings, you, you run for the hills. But that, that, was, that was just regular Friday night action. There was nothing special about that, you know. But boy, I'll tell you, when, when I got out of that school, I went on up to Stanford. My grades were good enough to get to Stanford. When I went up there, I started drinking with both hands. And when I say, I, I was a pig. See, I, I, I'm not one of those people who knows how to drink socially. I never know. I, one, I don't know what one drink means. I don't know, well, let's go out and have a drink. I don't know what the hell that means. I have no idea. I just know to go and just start drinking and just keep drinking. And the more I drink, the more I drink, the, the thirstier I get, the physically thirstier I get, until I'm just downing them as fast as you can bring them. And I'm drinking with both hands and I'm drinking hard liquor because beer takes too long and wine takes too goddamn long. And can't get me where I want to go. And I was taking all that speed so that I never, I very seldom if ever passed out. But I had, I spent my whole drinking career in walking blackouts. You know, I just kept going. So to me, my whole, I'm a blackout drinker and there's a whole section of my life that's just gone. Starting about now. See, when, I mean, in, in college, when I, when I started college. Um, First quarter, I almost went down the drain scholastically because, you know, you go to college and you sign up on the first day and then they don't care if they see you again until test time. If you don't show up for the test, they fail you. It's that easy. You're out. You know, no one cares. So, man, I had a hell of a time. I was just drinking and fighting and raising hell and doing, still trying to play ball and, and, and couldn't do it because I didn't have any senior year and no, no uh, scholarship and there were no freshman teams. And uh, about three weeks before it was time to, to, to go to finals, I was almost out of there, but I had a friend there, a little genius by the name of Malcolm McHenry. We called him DeBug. And DeBug is one of those guys, he come to Stanford, he signed up for the courses, and two weeks later he had them all aid. Didn't have to take it, he knew, he knew it all, he was teaching the teachers, you know, he was one of those guys. And uh, he was a good little guy and he could teach algebra to an ape. So a whole bunch of us got together and we paid him some money and he took us in the basement and we took nothing down there with us but Benzedrine and coffee. And, and for two weeks we stayed down there and he could jam enough of every course into our head so we could go in and take the final and come out and get a C minus, a D. But the next day we didn't remember the name of the course or the teacher or who the hell was in it or anything else. But, but we could do that. So, hey, easier, softer way, man. That's the way I went through college for three years. I just kept in touch with the bug and I'd go with the bug every quarter down in the basement and, and that's how I was going. Yeah, you know, I got bored after a while. I didn't get bored, but I got guilty. You know, I'm sitting there taking up space in college. I'm not doing anything. Somebody, somebody really wants to study uh, should, have, should be here and not me. And all I'm doing is drinking and raising hell. And I, I'd, I'd done some show business uh, up to then. I, like I said, I worked on my father's radio show, and I'd done some movies and some television. I made a record. It was a double gold-sided record, but uh, my old man always made us work in the summer up in Nevada. So I never knew I had a hit record until I came back, and my mother said, the money's in the bank and go to school. And that was the end of that. And, uh, but when I quit college, I came down and I went into show business. And I got an agent, and he said, well, you're a talented man. He says, hell, you can, you can, you do comedy. He says, you can, you can act, you can sing. He says, I, I don't really know where to start with you. He says, I think I'll start with you in nightclubs. I think I'll make you a nightclub singer. We'll do clubs. I said, that's great. We'll do clubs. Well, put an alcoholic speed freak like me to work in a nightclub. <laughs> you know, it's like turning a kid loose in the candy store and giving him the keys and going home. See? Because in every club I ever worked in, that you, from the day you get there, the first day of rehearsal till the day you leave, in your dressing room is a card table upon which sits uh, bottles of booze, every kind of booze known to mankind, and a little thing of little cup of ice and, and, and six little glasses. And, you, and every time you empty a bottle and put it down, there's a full one there, and you don't pay for any of it. Well, here I am. Now, I'm working in clubs. I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a speed freak. I've got all the ism going for me. I have to be perfect or nothing. Inside, I'm convinced that I have no talent and no looks and no ability and no brains and I'm mean and I'm ornery and I'm never going to get anywhere. All I got is a last name and the minute people find out that that's all I got, they're going to hate me and kick me out. And, and I have to do every show perfect or nothing. If I don't do it perfect, it's not. 
So I'm setting myself up with this every night. Every night. I don't realize, now I realize what I was doing to myself. Then I didn't. You know, I'm setting myself up to be perfect, knowing inside that I can't be perfect. So therefore, I'm a failure before I ever get out there. Sure enough, every night. Take two things. I started out, I had to have two or three drinks to get out there the first show. When I finished, I, it took a bottle to get me out there. You know, and then it wasn't any use getting out there. You know, but what would happen was I'd go out, I'd, I'd do an hour and 15 minutes of music and, uh, and comedy. And if I hit one bad note, that's all I heard. When I came off, people said, great show. And I said, you're a liar. I'd go in the dressing room, I'd slam the door, I'd grab the vodka bottle, knock the top in the corner and just drink and call myself names till the second show started. Second show would come, I'd go out there, now I'm really in the bag, and I'd blow two or three places. Now I'd come back, sit down again in the dressing room, drink until the guy that was cleaning up would come in there, so you gotta get out now. I'd go to the nearest after hours club, whatever town I was in, stay there till noon, and I'd go back to the hotel and lay down till four or five in the afternoon, rake around my eyes and get up and, you know, two drinks down, throw them up, third one stays, and then I'd go to work, a cup of coffee and, and a, pour a little brandy in the coffee, and then go out for the first show. And that's how I was living my life. You know, and I'm trying to pretend like I've got an ego as big as this building because that's what you need in this business that I'm in. You have to convince everybody you're the greatest. And inside, I'm feeling like an empty shell. I'm feeling like I'm the worst. I'm the lowest. I'm comparing my insides with everybody else's outsides, and I'm going to last place all the time. When I wasn't working clubs, I was coming in doing television shows and movies and stuff, and I would I would goof up. I'd get drunk the night before. I'd keep walking because of the speed. Seven o'clock in the morning, come. I was supposed to be at work. I'd still be drinking. So I missed two days. And I do another, I do a TV show and I'd miss a week of rehearsal and I'd get there at the last minute. I'd always come through at the last minute, but I gave everybody a heart attack doing it, you know. Everybody was scared to death I'd never make it. And by the grace of God, I always would. I don't know how. I, I always had to put myself on that, I always had to put myself on that cliff edge, man. I always had to, if I had a week to prepare for something, I didn't prepare for it until 20 minutes before time to do it. See? Always put myself right on that edge of failure, just so I'd be damn sure I'd be right there when the fall came, you know. I didn't know I was doing that then. I thought I was just having fun. You know, this to me was fun. And that crazy terror that would build up. See, I, I got hooked on that terror when I was a kid. And that, when, that terror, when I got bigger and that terror wasn't there anymore from that person, I had to put it there. See? I mean, I know now that's what I was doing. Long in here someplace I get drafted. This was cute. A guy like me who's really respect, has a lot of respect for authority after what it's done to me so far in life. You know? <laughs> So I got drafted, so I asked for six months. I said, give me the six months that they usually give people, you know, to, uh, to uh, uh, make movies and, and, and TV shows and records, and they, they, you, you stockpile them, and then you go into the Army, and you go, wherever you go overseas, your agent releases this stuff while you're gone, so it's like you're never gone. You come back, and, and it's like you're still there. No, I couldn't get six months. I couldn't get three months. I couldn't get anything but two weeks because the draft board, my draft board had been accused of favoritism the month before. They were caught hiding some guy's file, and I was the next name up. So I was gone. So I took a little piece of paper, I wrote, made 730 squares on it. That's two years, 730 days. And every, t every day I blocked one off. And I made up my mind I was going to stay as drunk as I could. Every day I was in the Army. And I made it. I did damn good at that, too, you know. And I was lucky. I had a lot of good friends that carried me around by the back of the neck and put me where I was supposed to be and stuff like that. Except for when the IG inspections came. That's when the Inspector General comes around to the post that you're on. And when that happens, all the bars on the post close down for the day. Well, I'd be so loaded the night before, I'd forget to buy a bottle. Next day, I'd wake up and, oh, my God, I couldn't find a drink anywhere. And around noon, I'd go on my head. And I'd start twitching and jerking and shaking. And they'd grab me and they'd stick a stick in my mouth. And I'd come out of it. And I'd look around and I'd see my faces of my friends, but I couldn't put the names with them. And so they took me to the, this happened three or four times. And they would take me to the neuropsychological ward because the neuro, neuropsychiatric and the neurological wards are on the same floor in the Army. So you're in there with the guys with no... No belt to their robe and the paper slippers, and you gotta ask a guy for a match, and you can't shave, you know, they stand over your shoulder while you shave, all that stuff. And they shot dye in my brain, and dye in my eyeballs, and dye in my butt, and dye everywhere else, and shot dye all over me, and then they said, you're an epileptic. <laughs> I said, does that mean I have to do any bad time? They said, no. I said, okay, I'll be an epileptic, but it's a... <laughs> okay by me as long as you guys keep counting them days off that's all I know I said, what do I have to do they said well you can't drive and uh, here's a here's some a prescription for you for Dilantin and Phenobarbital yeah see but that wasn't my stroke I didn't like that stuff I wanted to, I was up I was booze and speed I wanted to walk through walls and you know climb out you know go straight up in the air and turn left I didn't want to you know 
They say, hey, baby, that's cool stuff. That wasn't for me, man. I've got, that, I felt, when I, I, I tried marijuana, and when I tried that, I got to, I kept feeling like somebody's going to polax me from behind. I thought, sure, I was going to miss everything. I miss it. I was getting relaxed and cool. When I was getting relaxed, I couldn't shit. Oh, God, what am I going to do now? You know, somebody will ask me a question, and I won't know the answer. Shit, <laughs> you know. So I hated that stuff. I, Jesus, I didn't want to go near any of that. I, boy, I'd take all the speed you could give me. Anyway, I did two years in the army. I come out and I, you know I went to the doc. I was going to go back. In. I'm going back into showbiz, and uh, so I go to the doctor for a checkup. And I tell him, uh, you know, he said he asked for what I'm taking. I went tell him all the medication, all the speed I'm taking, and he turned white. And he asked me how much I drank, and I told him that, and he turned whiter still. And I said, by the way, I'm an epileptic. He says, you're a what? <laughs> I said, I, I I I'm an epileptic. And he says, who told you that? I said, the army doctors. He said, oh, uh-huh. He said, to tell you what, let me give you a physical here, and you come back in a week, and we'll talk about this. So he took some blood and tapped around and did all that stuff, and then I come back in a week, and he said, you're no epileptic. He said, you're a drunk, is what you are. He says, a whole different thing. So you're a drunk. I said, well, if you think I'm paying you for that, you're crazy. I said, I knew that. I said, you better give me some new information if you want any money, because I know all that already. I'm, I know I was an alcoholic. All my life, people were saying, you're an alcoholic. I said, that's right. And they said, well, don't you want to change? I said, give me a double. And they, said, <laughs> and they said, why did you do that? I said, because if I want to have to listen to your shit, I want to be drunk while I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, please. You know. So I said, I said, what does that mean with this stuff I'm supposed to be taking that I've been hiding under a pillow for a year? You know, he said, don't take that anymore. I said, can I have my driver's license back? He said, yeah, that was not the smartest move he ever made. <laughs> but I got the driver's license back. Now I'll go to work again in show business, see? Only now I'm really in great shape. And I was preparing an act to go to uh, Las Vegas. I'd already signed the contract with these boys up there. And, you know, they don't want to know if you're sick, see? They don't want to know. They just want to see your face and do your thing. And that's it. Bring money into the joint and make people gamble. So I'm preparing for that. And all of a sudden, I go home one night and I can't move from the neck down. I'm laying on a couch. And all of a sudden, I go to reach for the phone and nothing works. So luckily, there was a woman cleaning up the house. I said, uh, uh, call the, the hospital and uh, call Dr. Davis. And they called the doctor. And he got the ambulance there. And I went down to the hospital. And I'm laying in the bed. And nothing's, nothing's moving, nothing's going, and he's asking me what I'm taking, and I'm telling him, and then he, once again, there's another doctor turning white. And I told him how much I drank, and which is about as much as he did, by the way. <laughs> he didn't, it didn't shock him when I drank, because good old doc, he was in there real good, too. Um, but anyway, he sent me, he kept coming, he said, you take any digitalis? I said, what the hell is that? He said, well, it's a heart medication for people, you don't have a heart problem. I said, no. He said, no digital. I said, no. He says, digitalis keep it. I said, well, I can't help it. I don't take it. So he got all my pills down from the house, all the speed that I was taking, the street drugs and the stuff. I, you know, I had about four different doctors giving me different diet pills. One wasn't enough, you know. So he brought one and he found a, when one group of me came in after he analyzed them, he said, these things are loaded with digitalis and you've had a partial heart block. He said, you can't do anything. You've got to go home and lay down for six months. You can't work. You can't do anything. And I said, you don't understand. I just signed a contract with these guys. I'm going to do something real soon, it's, even if it's die, but I'm going to do something. I have to do something. He says, well, I don't know what it is. He says, I, I guess, he says, I'll give you a prescription for a shot of B12 and a shot of Dexedrine once a night. He said, you take that in, uh, before your first show. He said, and when you do this, do the show after you, when you do the first show, tell the people who are coming on next, be ready, because you might go on your nose right after the first show every night. He said, if you don't and you make it through the engagement, you'll only make it through by going to your room, lying down, not drinking, not using, and not carousing around at night and getting all the rest you can get. That's what you have to do in order to succeed up there. So I said, eh, okay, fine. So I went up there and it was agony, but I did it his way. And I fell in love with the captain of the line. She fell in love with me. Uh, we, this is making a long story short, and eventually we got married. And I, we moved down to L.A. She had a five-year-old son in New York with her mother. He came out. I adopted him. Now I'm sitting here with a wife, a brand-new wife, and a son, five years old, that I've adopted. And neither one of them knows that I drink. <laughs> See? Because that's the only time they knew me was when I was under this doctor's care. Now we get married, and the doctor says, you're okay. 
And the next 11 months was not the happiest in her life. Because I went right back to my pattern. You know, we, my pattern was to drink. I drank. I had one with you one night, two the next, 14 the next, six the next, none the next. But within the 30-day period, there would be three days and three nights where I was gone. See, gone. And I never knew when that was coming. There was no, like, I'm going to go out and do this. It was just like any other night, and I'd wake up in Detroit, you know, or Florida, or, or someplace, laying in a hotel room, laying next to some rhino that looked worse than me, and that was hard to do in them days, you know. And I'd have to get over the top of her and get out of the bed and go over to the, to the hotel and pull the Bible out and look in the flyleaf to see what town I was in, you know. You, yeah. Well, you know, you cannot call down to the desk and say, where am I, because they'll come up for the money right away. They, they, you know, they're not going to let anybody lay up there that don't know what town he's in, you know. So then I'd have to phone home and they'd send me money and I'd go home and... And I'd get on my knees to my wife and I'd say, Honey, I, I swear to you, I'll never do this again. And a man, haven't we all meant it? How many times have we said it and meant it? You know, meant it every time. Sweetheart, I swear I'll never do this again. I promise I won't do that. I swear to God I'll never do this again. Next month, same thing. Next month, same thing. See? Eleven months went by and came home one, one time and nobody there. No kid, no wife. Two weeks later, a strange lawyer calls me. I go to his office. She's sitting there. Lawyer says, you got to go away and dry out and never take another drink or use or your wife's going to leave you because she can't stand to see you kill yourself. Now, I didn't think I had any drinking problem. I didn't drink anymore anybody else I knew. Of course, I was hanging out with nothing but drunks, but, you know. <laughs> but a, a strange thing had happened in that 11-month period. I had got the feeling that there were two human beings that I loved very much, and they were counting on me. Somebody in the world was counting on me to do something. See, that never happened to me before because all that was counting on me was me. And as long as there was only me involved, I didn't give a damn. See, I could let myself down real good. I could, I could blow my expectations out the window real easy. But two people were counting on me, and I liked these two people, and I loved them, and I, you know. So I thought, well, what the hell? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go away. I'll go to this place. So they picked out a place for me, some rich man's dry-out clinic back in Connecticut. And I went back there, and... Uh, uh, Amongst the other reading that they gave us at this place was the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they just threw that in there. And I picked that up. And uh, uh, what this genius did, was I read all the stories in the back, see. But the first 164 pages looked like directions, and they were boring. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's, I, didn't, that was, I didn't read that stuff. That, was, that took too long. You know, I didn't understand it, you know, so... So that's what I did. And at this place, they teach, you how to, they teach you how to make a tray and paint a picture. And you play racquetball. And you talk to the shrink twice a day. And you eat three square meals a day. And then on the weekends, everybody goes in town and gets drunk. Okay. <laughs> everybody except me. I'm playing it by the numbers. And I'm looking around. Saturday comes. I can't find nobody to talk to. And Monday morning comes. And here they all are back looking like they've been road hard and put away wet. And they, and they, start, and they start week one. See, and I'm now on about week five. So I asked the shrink once, I said, what the hell is going on here? He says, well, they go in town. and they... I said, but anyway, this is a voluntary locker. You're supposed to stay here. He says, yeah, I know, but they don't, so they have to start week one again. I said, let me be the vice president of this place. You guys got a great racket going here. They pay again, too? He says, yes. Ho, oh, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. This is lovely. I said, how do you get out of here? He says, you get drunk. I said, I can do that. So the next Saturday, I went downtown. I bought a big quart of vodka over the bar, loud voice in front of God and everybody in this little town, so I make sure that got, the word got back. I went to the gardener's place, and I got ripped for two days. I walked back in Monday. I said, I got drunk. They said, you're gone. I said, so long. I left there, and I went home, and I walked through the front door, and I looked at my wife, and I said, well, I got drunk. I got kicked out of there. I said, but I'll I tell you what. I said, I'm going to make you a promise for the last time. I said, I'm never going to drink or use again. And she looked at me and went, uh -huh. yeah. Well, that became the first thing, on, first point on my agenda. See, was to get rid of that look on her face. Now starts the 19-year dry drunk. And I'm, the first thing I could think of was to try to get rid of that look on her face and that attitude. Every time I'd leave the house, I'd say, I'm going to the gym or I'm going here. She's going, uh-huh. I said, I'll be right back. She said, yes, sure. You know, I didn't know how else to do it except to just keep doing it. See, that's the kind of guy I am. I'm just, you know, I, I, I bite you in the butt and I don't let go till sunset. I just hang on, man. I can hang on till death, man. And I just kept going out and coming in. I just kept going out and coming back sober, going out and coming back sober. And finally, after about two years, one day I said, I'm going to the gym. I'll be back. And she said, okay, great. And, and the look was gone. The attitude was gone. And I felt good about that. But what was happening to me was I, was, I am now 
an alcoholic just like everybody in this room with all of the same feelings and all of the same emotions and all of the same false evidence appearing real, all the fear, all the agony and no medication because I'm not drinking and I'm not using anymore. And what's happening is I'm looking around and the whole world is everybody I know is everybody I've been telling me all my life if I quit drinking and using I'd be a star. I had lots of talent. Everything would be fine. Well, there wasn't nothing happening. See? Because everybody got wise to me, so there was no work coming in at all. And every day, and all I wanted to do, man, I was consumed with the desire to show people that I, could, that I was okay and that I could do the job and I wasn't the bum they thought I was. And all I needed was a chance, man, if they just give me a chance. And every day that I woke up and I didn't have a job, in my own mind I was a bum. I was what they thought I was. I was a rich man's kid with no talent and no desire and no hustle and no ability and all I wanted to do was suck off my old man's money. And the thought that people thought that of me just drove me crazy. Every morning I woke up that I didn't have a job, I hated myself worse and worse. Every morning I prayed to God for a job. Please, God, give me a job. Every time a job came up, there was this close. It was a big job, and I'd say to God, this one could make it for me, God. This one could get me there. This one could get me going again. And I'd pray, and I'd pray. And I got tighter and tighter with the church. I thought that was the answer. I got back to the Catholic Church, and I got tighter. I was going to daily confession and communion. I, was, I, said, I said, God, I'll pray three hours a day if you give me this job. Whatever it is, I'd go down. Every time an important job came, I'd go down. I'd, be, I'd always be the last guy in contention, this close every time, and I wouldn't get it. And then little jobs would come along that would take that day's work here, a little thing there, something like that. And I'd get that like this. And I'd say to God, I, that, this is not that. I don't need this. Give me that one. I want that job, God. This is the job I have. I'll tell you what, God, I'll straighten it up even more. I was per Man, no cheating on the wife. I was there for my son all the time. Whenever he needed me, I was in the house. That, of course, that was God's will. I didn't realize it at the time. You know, I thought that was my doing. I was taking vows for that. But I was always there for him, and I was always made myself available, and I was trying to be a good father and a good husband and, and, a, and a good everything and a good Catholic and do all that. And just the tight, every time I didn't get a job, I'd come home and just make it tighter and tighter and tighter and do more praying and harder. And, and somewhere along about the seventh, eighth year of this, and nothing was happening, and suddenly my, my insanity, my, my brain really blew out, and I, I became convinced that God was going to make me pay the second half of my life for the first half. And the way he was going to do that was to dangle things that I wanted in front of my face until I was this close to getting them, and then he was going to pull them away. And I said, okay, God, I ain't playing that game. And I slammed the door. And I only came out to go to the grocery store and to go to the gym, and that's all I left the house for. If they had an interview or a job for me to go to, I went saying to God, you ain't going to give me this one. You ain't fooling me, man. I know I'm not going to This is a good job. I'm not going to get this. And I'd go down, and I'd be there for the reading along with 50 other guys, and I'd walk in. I'd say, give me the script. Give me the script. So I'd say, Okay, you ready? Because I'm double parked. There you go. And I'd walk out. Because I knew I wasn't going to get that one. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't a lot. I didn't a lot. And my self-respect went to hell and everything. And the rage and the anger. The anger, the anger, the anger kept building and building. The anger that I had in the time I was a child kept building and building. And all I did was get in people's... I'd get mad 50 times a day. I'd get in people's face. I'd fight people. I'd argue with people. I'd say things to people till they had to swing on me first, and then I'd, then I'd destroy them. I'd yell. I'd scream. And every, but my wife and kid, and I'd say, I love you too. I love you too. Them bastards I hate. I can't stand them. And I thought I could build walls against the hurt and against the rejection and against the fear and, and keep them out and let the love come through. But what was happening to me was I was building up those walls, and I built them up, and the adobe dried, and then I realized that nothing could get through. Not good stuff either. You can keep the bad stuff out. You won't get hurt, but you can't love anymore, and you can't be loved, and you can't be touched. And there I was back there. And back there, and all I was saying to God was, all right, I understand. Just don't look at me at all. I won't look at you. You won't look at me. It's a tie, okay? And if, if, if you want to do something for me, just let me have a day when nobody else has any luck either so I can start even, you know? <laughs> let me just have a day when nobody else will start even. And that's, and that's what I went on. I was sniveling and crying and whining. And, and I just had to have, give me, give me, give me. If I just had that, if I just had that. I, and I never, as, as we well know, I never got that. You know? After 19 years of that, my wife said to me, I'm sorry, but I got to go. I had married a woman who was a positive thinker and a, a bright and shining uh, person and who was up about everything. And after 19 years of me, the cynicism damn near killed her and the anger. But I got to go. 
I had married a woman who was a positive thinker and a, a bright and shining uh, person and who was up about everything. And after 19 years of me, the cynicism damn near killed her and the anger and the despair and the depression. So she, uh, she, she, she divorced me. And that's when I really hit bottom because I said to myself, the two things I thought I'd been doing good for 19 years was being a husband and a father. Now I found out I ain't even doing that. You know? So I packed up a television set and some plastic spoons and forks and some Melmac and I jumped into an apartment over there on Herrett Street in L.A. and I just slammed the door and I sat in there and I, uh, I figured this is it. And I wasn't going to go anywhere and do nothing. And, and, and then suddenly my life took a turn, see, that I had absolutely nothing to do with. I got a part in a picture. A guy wrote a part, wrote a picture, and he wrote a part for himself, but he wasn't an actor, so he wrote a part with no lines, see, because he was scared. Then he was so scared he didn't want to do the part. So he called me and he asked me to do the part, so I did the part. Now I run into a girl, and we dig each other, and we start making, setting up a little light housekeeping, and one thing and another, and we get fond of one another and in love and all that, and then I moved to Vegas. I said, I can't make it in this business. To hell with this. I said, it, it, when they do, they hire me once a year. I said, I don't have to be sitting in this town for once a year. Let's go someplace where it's, her family lived in Vegas. So we moved up there. Now I'm up there and I'm starting to play tennis. And I'm used to playing tennis and I'm a smoker. And, you know, I'm, I'm used to getting my second wind. You know, you play for, you, you, you pant for a while. Then you move slow and pick up the ball. You're a little slow when you serve and you take it easy. And you get your second wind coming. I couldn't get that anymore. I'd be laying in bed watching television. And suddenly it would be like... I had to take a deep breath like that. It's like I'd forgotten to breathe for 30 seconds or something, you know. My wife said, what is that? And I said, I don't know. I'm just getting old. She says, I don't like that. Go see the doctor. Not me. You don't tell, first of all, you don't tell me what to do. If you tell me what to do, if you want me to do something, tell me not to do it. Then I'll do it. <laughs> don't say do that because I ain't going to do that if you say do that. And I don't ever go see no doctors on any of okay, at all, forever, for nothing. I have no idea why. No idea. I went to see the doctor. The doctor gave me an EEG. He said, I don't like what I see in these four boxes. You go see my friend, the heart specialist. Never would I do that. Ever. That's, I would have, my, my thing is to laugh at the guy and say, sure, I'll see him. Make an appointment for me. And then I moved to Cleveland. You know, well, that's how I work. I have no idea why. I went and saw the heart specialist. He gave me an angiogram. That's the thing where you go up into your heart and they shoot dye in there and you look on the television screen and you're watching your heart pump and you see what the, where the blockages are. He says, you've got 95% blockage in two of your arteries and 65 in another. He says, you haven't had a heart attack yet, but you could have one in a minute. He said, you better get in the hospital in San Francisco. I'm going to call Dr. Hill right now and have a triple bypass. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And you better have it to, like now. And in two days, I was in that hospital with that doctor. He'd done all the tests on me. He was sitting on the end of my bed. And he said... Uh, you're here for two reasons, smoking and anger. He said, how many times a day do you get mad? I said, I wake up in the morning knowing I'm going to have to fight somebody, and the rest of the day I'm just trying to figure out who it is, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, that's real cute dialogue, and that's real funny stuff. He said, but I'll tell you what you've done to yourself. He said, you get mad 30, 40 times a day, and you pump adrenaline and noradrenaline through your system, and you've nicked the inside of your veins. When that happens, the little cholesterol that you do have falls in there, and you have the same problem as a guy with a high cholesterol count. He said, now I'm going to do a triple bypass on you. I'm going to take a vein out of your leg and I'm going to replace those veins around there. But I'm going to tell you one thing. And he wasn't on the program, folks. He said, if you don't alter your attitudes, you're going to be dead in three years anyway. He says, the anger will kill you. You can't go on like this. You can't. So you better find a way to alter your attitudes. Well, I don't know why, but I listened to the man. I'm going to, I'm going to have the surgery. Now that night before the surgery, I'm laying up there. First thing they do is shave your body. Now, if you've ever looked at your body after it's shaved, it ain't your body. <laughs> Somebody has snuck a new one in there on you because you ain't never seen this in your whole life. This don't look, there's nothing here familiar at all. This is not. And then you have to take two showers with that stuff called betadine, which is a brown, yellow iodine soap, and it stains you. you it doesn't come off. You, 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 just, you bathe with it. So the effect you get around three in the morning is you're laying there looking at yourself and you look like a barbecued chicken. Okay. Now, having the ego of an alcoholic, I am in this position, smoking my last cigarettes, my last 20 cigarettes of my life. And at the same time, I am making a deal with God. A barbecue chicken is making a deal with God. So I'll tell you what. See, one more time. I'll tell you how I'm going to do this. You get me through this operation... 
And then I'll go see what he, about the Beatitudes with the altering, whatever that was that he talked about. I don't, you know. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go do that. If you get me through the operation, and it don't hurt too much. Okay. Well, I come through the operation, now I'm stuck. I gotta go do something about altering my attitudes, which I don't know what the hell that means. My attitude is fine. It's you that stink. I'm fine. If you would just act right, I would be fine. I have to stay mad at you because you're all such idiots. See? So, once more, God steps into my life. I come down. There's a guy named Bill Rader who runs a, the alcohol world down south there in L.A. He gave me the name of a woman named Lelia Gary, a shrink. And I went to this woman. She's a genius. She gets me in there and she gets me hooked real good on her. See? Sees me alone for about four times. Then she gets me into a group. Get real hooked on the group. And then she says to me, you're too angry. You've got to go to AA. I said, what? She said, you have to go to AA. I said, are you crazy? I said, I told you, I haven't had a drink or any speed in 19 years and my life is still a bag of garbage. I said, now I can't smoke or drink coffee. What the hell am I going to do down at AA? You know. I said, I, 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 you know, what am I going to learn? What am I going to learn down there? And she says, I can't tell you. You've got to go find out. I said, ah, <laughs> no, no, no. I said, I've been with you. See, I've been to shrinks since I was 18. Eight million shrinks. I said, that's shrink talk. I know that. I said, I know how that works. I said, here's how it's going to be. One more time. Here's how it's going to be. You tell me what I'm going to learn down there at AA, and then, I, then I'll, I'll, if I like what I hear, I'll go. See? And she says, it don't work that way, Gary. I said, how does it work? She says, well, I'll tell you. She says, if you don't go to AA, you can't come back here anymore. That is automatic for a guy like me. Go to hell and I'm gone. I'm gone. Who needs you? What do you mean? You're going to tell me what to do? Get out of my face. You know, I have no idea why. No idea why. I did what she said. Now, in the 19-year dry drunk that I was on before I got to her, I, the, the, the ego sometimes just boggles my mind. Because I had a famous last name, people were calling me to give talks about not being a drunk anymore. And I went to youth groups, and I went to jails, and I talked to guys about not being a drunk anymore. And they'd listen, and then they'd say, how are you staying sober? I said, don't do it my way. I said, the only reason I'm sober is because there's about 15 people in the hiring and firing department of my business that are just waiting for me to fall on my ass so they can say, see, I told you so, and I ain't never going to give them the satisfaction. <laughs> see? But don't do it my way, because that. Go to AA. AA knows they'll they'll cure you, they'll help you, they'll fix you, they'll do all. You go there. I must have sent 2,500 people to AA in 19 years. See? Everybody but me. I didn't send me. See? Now I got to call one of these guys. So I call him on the phone. I said, "Hey, you do you went to?" AA? Yeah. I said, "What uh, what goes on down at those meetings they have?" He says, "I can't tell you. You have to go find out." <laughs> I said, the I said, I don't understand. I said, I, I know you ain't a shrink. You ain't smart enough. I said, what? He said, just come with me. Come down. We'll come down and we'll go to a meeting. I said, what? Where? He said, 1130 Radford Street. That's in, that's in Studio City. So I made an appointment to meet him down there. And uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. Now, I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm one of those guys who walked through those doors. And I wasn't in the room 45 seconds. And I knew I was where I should have been my whole goddamn life. See? I just knew it. That feeling comes over you. For anybody out there who's experienced it that way, that's how it happens. You just know. There's a feeling that ha And I'll never forget that first meeting. I don't care how... Because, you know, I was real hinky and real uptight and real, you know... It was a spooky situation. I only knew one guy and, you know, and going down there. And, and suddenly, that feeling came over me. I felt... This really sound, going to sound corny. But I felt loved. I, I, I felt non-threatened. All my life I felt threatened in front of people. I felt non-threatened. I sat down, I got a cup of coffee, and I sat down with some guys, and we, and we sat there. We, we talked for half an hour, then the meeting started, and I, all of a sudden I'm listening to people getting, and God, it was a perfect day for me, you know, because God had it set up. Everybody that stood up, told part of my story that I had hidden in the closet that I didn't want anybody to know about and they'd get up and say the same feelings and the same they were the same actions and everything and everybody in the audience would laugh and I'd think Jesus these people don't even think this much about it and I'm hiding it in the closet going crazy for, for somebody will find out I think that way or I act that way or I act that way you know 
And I thought, my God, is how long has this been going on that I didn't know about? Jesus, what's the matter with me, you know? And God, I was just, I was just absolutely enthralled by the meeting. And, and after the meeting, we went out and we had lunch and we had coffee. And then I said goodbye. And I went. I knew I, I knew I was into something good. See, I'm no rocket scientist. You probably can tell by now. But I knew I had a hold of something good. And like I said, I'm that bulldog man. When I get something good, I grab a hold there. I don't let go. And I was back in my house. I took two steps into my house. The door shut behind me, and it hit me like a lightning bolt. Something that really sold it to me, and that's this, that all my life, from the time I was this big on, any time I was with two or more people that I didn't know, I did a character. A guy comes up, like a, and he's a fat Jack Leonard and a Don Rickles type. And that's who I do. And I hide back here and I do him. And I don't care if you like him or hate him or what the hell you want to do with him or fight him or love him or what it is. You just watch him and I'll lay back here and see who I got trouble with. See? And that's how I conducted my life. This guy, I always stuck this guy out here. Whenever I was around anybody, I didn't know. And I, took, I was in my house that day and realized that I had spent like five hours with a group of people. I knew one guy. Everybody else I didn't know. And this guy had never come up. And I had not consciously tried to keep him from coming up. He just didn't show that day. That's the first day he didn't show in 48 years of my life. So I knew I was into something good. See, I knew I was into something good. So I, and also I was willing. As, you know, I guess because for 19 years, God in his infinite wisdom and mercy let me live my life the way I wanted to. See, everything would go to AA. See, he let me walk, run headlong through every door that was there and bang my head against the brick wall on the other side and bounce off and get up and start for another one. I tried psychocybernetics. I tried psychiatry. I tried Maxwell Malls. I tried the magic power of believing, the magic power of your ass, the magic power of this, the magic power of that, the mag all that stuff. Norman Vincent Peale, church, everything. Everything was to, to live a happy life, to live some kind of a happy life, to get out of the misery and the hurt and the loneliness and the anger and the fear and the depression I was in, and none of them worked. But he let me walk up, go right into every one of them until finally there was one door left. When I finally was in the shape, so I was beat to my knees, that's when he showed me that door. I said, okay, now go through here. So I was willing. And I knew I was in amongst a bunch of people. It's the first time I felt like I belonged since I quit playing ball when I was 17. First time I felt like I was really, I wasn't on the outside looking in anymore. You know, I wasn't feeling, I wasn't feeling less than. I was, I was feeling a part of. And it was a great feeling. I knew I had something good here. And all these people, I'm thinking to myself, I'm saying, geez, they... You know, they all feel and walk and talk and act and think the same way you do. For the first time in your life, you're not just a crazy man. You're in with all the crazy men. <laughs> and, and they're all living a happy, ser fairly serene uh, life. They're not drinking and not using. And, and they always saying it's okay. Whatever happens is okay. So I knew I was into something good. So I thought to myself, I'm going to do what they say. See, because I heard somebody say, you know, your best thinking got you to the outside of this door. In 48 years of your life, that's the best you could do. See, so I figured, well, I'll do it their way. Let me see what that's like to just do it. Because I knew I did. I knew I wasn't a human being. I knew I didn't know nothing about loving or living or being a human being or a friend or a, or anything. See, just a wise guy. That's all I knew how to be. And a drunk and a, and a, and and a barroom brawler. And that's all I knew. And I didn't want that anymore. I wanted what you guys had. See, so I said, if, if it's get naked and sit on the flagpole and hum come to Jesus, I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. In there, see? <laughs> you know, because I'm saying to myself, it's going whatever it is is going to sound crazy. See, because what sounds good to me is nuts. So whatever they say is going to be good and sound crazy. Does that make sense to anybody in here? You know, I, I just kind of I reversed it. I said, okay, I'll do it, that, do that, whatever that is they say. See. So we started, I started talking, and there was some, thank God, and once again, you know, God always works through people, and there was a, plenty of old-timers around. And, we started, and I learned things, see. I've learned a lot. I've learned so much. I could take another five hours just to, just to get on what I learned in the first year because I was really a, I was a sponge, man. I sucked it up as quick as they could give it to me because I needed all, I, you know, my biggest fear of my entire life is, and I'm sure is the same with you. Our biggest fear is trying to live life without knowing how. See? That's what scares me worse than anything. And I got on this program and I started to learn how. The first thing I learned was I had a disease. See? It had nothing to do with me being a good boy, a bad boy, a weak boy, a strong boy. A nice boy, a bad boy, it did nothing. It had nothing to do with that. Immoral, immoral, nothing. I have a disease. I have a disease. See? It's a killer disease. See? It's like diabetes. It's like cancer. But yet, those people with diabetes and cancer would love to have what I've got the opportunity to have here now. See, because I've got a place that I can go 
and a program that I can work. And if I just do the simple things that they ask me to do there and go to that place as many times a week as I can, a truck is going to hit me and kill me before my disease does. Now, somebody with cancer or diabetes, it's sure like a shot like that. So I'm into something really good here. So I've learned. I have a disease, and it's physical, and it's mental, it's emotional, and it's spiritual. You know? And I learned that there's a place called Alcoholics Anonymous that you go to as many times a week as you can, and you go to what they call meetings. And you go to meetings, and the meetings are like a spiritual smorgasbord. It's laid out for you every day, participation meetings especially. You go to the meetings, and people get up and they share, and, and you like this, and you like some of that, and you take that with you that day, and ah, that, I don't need that, and this doesn't sound good, so you leave that that day, and you take a little of this, and you leave a little of that, and the next day you come back, and the things that didn't sound good sound good today, so you take them, and you put the other things back, <laughs> and you know, you come every day, or every day you can, and you get what you need spiritually to keep you from drinking and using one day at a time. If it's just maybe to come in the meeting house and make contact and say, Hi, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. And you see the friends you know and you shake their hand. If you can get that much that day. That's the sustenance that we need that keeps the disease that we have from, from annihilating us. And I learned that the incurable part of my disease is that this, this will never go away. This thing is broken. This thing's bad tapes were put in here a long time ago, see? And this thing works like, I'm going to kill you. Whatever... <laughs> Whatever it is out there, I'm going to kill you. It ain't no good. Well, life is a bag. You're too old. I, I, I say this many times, and, and still, to this day, every morning when I wake up, the alarm goes off, I turn it off, and I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too mean, I'm too ugly, I'm too short, I'm not good enough, I'm too good, I'm everything else. And then I say, now, since I'm on the program, I say, okay, committee, get the hell out of there. God, come on in here and take over and get this, you know. And I go on with my day. But that's still there. See, that's the point I'm trying to make is that's still there. That's always going to be there. This thing up here, this idea shredder, that God put on my shoulders. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, give me any good idea. I can put it in here and be, leave me alone in the room for an hour and it'll come out shit. There ain't no two ways about it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. But I, but, but I learned that about me. So now I don't try, now I don't count on this. When this tells me don't go to meetings, I go. When this says you don't need a meeting, I go. When this says... You, those people are too good for you. You're not good enough to go to a meeting. I go. I go when it don't say nothing. I go. Okay? I don't listen to this anymore. This is broken. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work. I got into the program. You know, when I got into the program, I hadn't had a drink or, or, or a pill in uh, 19 years. I was there to deal with the ism and the anger that was killing me. And when I got to dealing with the anger, the, uh, you know... The old timers told me the things like you can't afford resentments, you're an alcoholic, resentments is the biggest killer of alcoholics in the world. When somebody, when somebody makes you angry, you've got to pray for them, you've got to let it go, you've got to release it. They're telling me all these things and I said, wait a minute, you guys don't understand about my anger. I said, I'd be talking with somebody and we're having a nice talk and we're laughing and joking and something. Somebody says something from over here and before there's just a shot, a violent shot that goes up my spine and explodes in my brain and I got him like this and I'm hammering as I'm screaming, don't do that, I'm doing it. I said, I don't have, I don't have this long to think about what you guys are telling me to think about, you know, as far as anger goes. One old guy says, well, dummy, why don't you just pray to God for the instant you need to think the stuff that we're telling you to think? And he says, don't, don't wait around for the fight to start before you pray to God. Pray to God in your morning prayers and your evening prayers and pray for the instant you need in order to use the program to keep you from doing the things that you used to do. So I did that. I started doing that. I've done that every day for seven years. I haven't hit anybody. Nobody's hit me in seven years. See? And I ain't saying I don't get angry. There's times when I get angry. But the funny thing is now when I get angry... I hear it start, I use it, and the minute I hear that note in my voice, the whole program kicks in. So you don't have to do that if you don't want to anymore. See, just like you don't have to drink and use if you don't want to anymore. Why are you going to give up 15 seconds of your life for this guy? What are you angry about? And, and with the anger, I've also learned that all of my anger, and this is the most important thing for me to be able to say to you folks now, i found every time I do this, another layer of anger goes away. I am afraid. I am scared to death of life, of living, of reality, of people, and I always have been. And I was never allowed to admit it. See, I'm a boy child. Man child doesn't say to his mama, his brother, his sister, his cousin, his daddy, his girlfriend, his best friend, nobody. He don't tell him he's scared. You don't do that. See, it's not okay to be scared if you're a man.
you're mad. It's okay to be mad, though. It's okay to be angry. I can be pissed off. I can want to kill you. I can want to rip your throat out. I can want to destroy you. I can want to run a car into a building. I can want to do... But don't be scared. Well, now I am scared. And I'm admitting it. And the more I admit that I'm frightened to death, the better, the less anger I have. The more my anger goes away. Now, like I said, I'm no rocket scientist. I don't know why it works that way, but it does. See? So every time I can get up here and say, folks, I'm scared. And I'm still scared. But they also taught me on this program how to deal with fear. They also taught me that it's false evidence appearing real. That this thing makes me scared. See, this thing, when I'm scared, this thing, that's, this thing's working again. But this thing is telling me it's projecting doom from the minute from now into the future. Whatever is in the future for me is going to go in the toilet. That's why I'm scared. Whenever I'm scared, whenever I'm, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid he's going to take away from me? What am I afraid I'm not going to get from him? That always works. It's always somewhere in there. It's always somewhere in there. And the last thing that they taught me is that if I'm working the third step, what the hell have I got to be afraid of? Fear is, fear is, is non-existent if you're working the third step. If you have turned your will and your life over to the care of God, an infinite being who loves you infinitely and only wants the best for you, then the only thing you're afraid of is that what you're looking at is not what you want. And he who can see the future has to take you through there in order to get you there. And you can't see the future, so you're looking here going, No, I don't want that. I'm scared of that. See? So if you really believe in the third step, then you ain't got no business being afraid, boy. See? And I start to think about that, and I say, Yeah, I guess so. The third step was the most important, one of the most important things I learned on this program, is that when I learned that I could take my, my... See, I always thought I was in charge. See? And that made a mess of my life, see? And all that time when I was saying, I want God, God, give me, give me what I'll give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me this. You know, an old timer said to me, I was explaining that one day, and an old timer said to me, did it ever occur to you to look in the other hand and see what you got? <laughs> Never. And suddenly I started to look over here and I started to see, I didn't get nothing I wanted. But I've got everything I need. I've got only change out in the outside. My, my life is still the same as far as the career goes and the money goes and all that. That's still in the dumper, and I don't care anymore. That's not important anymore. That's the big change. The only thing that's changed outside is that I've got a wife now who's on the program. She's a wonderful woman. She's got as much time as I do. She's got three daughters from a former marriage, and I've inherited them. And it's like being married to a walking big book, you know. <laughs> yeah. I can't get away with my shit anymore. You know, every time I start to get angry, I'm looking into a pair of eyes and saying, I wonder when this idiot is going to realize he's got a program he can work. He don't have to do that yelling and hollering anymore, you know. So that shoots me down, see. I've got her, and that's... But, but that third one, when I can put God in charge of my life, and, and now that I can do that, and stay the hell out of my results, and my sponsor told me, he said, you put your life in God's hands. Now, you're a singer and an actor. If tomorrow God wants you to be a plumber, here's the kind of trust I want you to develop. If God wants you to be a plumber tomorrow, you give up singing and acting with a song in your heart, and you go be a plumber humming a tune because you know that if that's what God wants for you, you're going to be the happiest goddamn plumber in town, and it's going to be the best thing for you, and what you want don't matter anyway. So I'm working on developing that kind of trust. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to tell you it's there yet, but uh, hey, progress, progress, right? No, no perfection, progress. Well, I'm, I'm working, I'm getting there, one day at a time, one step at a time. I've also learned, like I said before, to forget my head and listen to my heart. They say AA is the, 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 is the rife with the language of the heart. I know my head doesn't work. I know if I listen to this little voice in here, and when I want an answer to a problem now, all I got to do is shut my eyes and I say, God, here's the problem. What should I do? And the first answer that comes is the right one. It's never the one I want to hear, but it's the one from God before my head goes, yeah, but you should, but maybe we should and we would and we could if we maybe if and that, you know, all that shit starts. The first answer that comes is God. And I do that now and that works. I live in life today. I live in the now. I can't live in the future. For me, the future is, if somebody says, Gary, listen, two weeks from now, my heart hits my shoes. If somebody comes up to me and says, hey, Gary, remember me from five years ago? I go, oh, God, you know, guilt in the past. I can only live in the now. The only way I can stay serene is that right now I'm here, I'm talking to you, and I'm standing. And I found out a great thing in Chuck C.'s book, New Pair of Glasses, and, and it really works for me, and that's this. 
As far as career and money and all that crap goes that I used to worry about and kill myself about and get angry about and all that, that's all gone. What I do now is I do one thing. I remember my primary purpose, which is to stay sober and help another alcoholic, and I make that my primary purpose in life. I go for that. In other words, now when I wake up, I'm going to go to a meeting today. I'm going to do something about Alcoholics Anonymous today. I'm going to call another drunk. I'm going to talk to my sponsor. I'm going to do something Alcoholics Anonymous today. Now, that's God's business for me, as far as I'm concerned. I do that. And strangely enough, he seems to take care of all the other business. See, that's his. Whether or not I work, whether or not I have a check coming in or not, if there's gas in the car, if I have a house, he, he seems to handle all that real good without any help from me whatsoever. See? So I do his work that he wants me to do, and he does my work. See? And it works out just fine. I got a happy life now. I'm, I'm seven years old now. See? Because I, I, I don't know anything. I don't count any, any part of living before I got here because, once again, only since I've been here have I, have I started to live life and know and understand how. You know? I understand that I'm an alcoholic and I always will be. I understand that my life is here in these rooms with you people. This is the most, this will keep me alive, this will keep me going. My self-worth has improved a thousand percent since I came on this program. Only by being of service. Only by doing the little things that they told me to do. Picking up cups, cleaning up ashtrays, cleaning up after meetings, setting up meetings, being secretaries, talking, speaking, doing whatever I can do. Sponsoring. I feel better about me now than I ever did when I was on top of the world. When I was on top of the world, inside I was a bag of garbage. Now I feel like I, I, I like myself. And because I like myself, I can like you. And I can like God. See? And then God loves me. And then I love myself, and then I love you. Hopefully that's the way it's going to work out. Like I said, I ain't there yet, but I'm still working at it. Thanks a lot for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.